cried and I strove to remind you that for those tears I died your goodness so great I can't I give you my heart and my soul. I know that without God, I'd never be whole. Savior, you opened all the right doors. And I thank you and praise you from earth's humble shore. Be with Christ my Savior. 
Those things that I someday shall see Jesus, my friend of Calvary Jesus shall lead me night and day Jesus shall lead me all the way He is the truest friend to me For I remember
simple follies I deny for thee. My love, my life, my all I give thee. I love thee, Lord, I love thee, Lord, more than thee. Love is the me. I'm going to ask my sister Ruth to tell us about live streaming. Some people have asked me, and I have the foggiest notion. Okay, live streaming is available right now if you click on a link at the Crescent Church website. And also, 
after this has been recorded, the service, it will also be available as a link on the Crescent Church website. You will see both links there available. Thank you, Ruth. I saw some people nodding their heads sagely and others hadn't the foggiest notion what she was talking about either, which, is, which includes me. Thank you all for coming. I said I wasn't going to cry tonight, and I'm not. It's not me crying. But for you to come and honor my father, the greatest man I ever met. Thank you. Thank you. And we've got people coming from all over the world who are with us tonight. One of the advantages of being born into a missionary family is that, well, you get to see a lot of the world and you live in different countries. One of the disadvantages of being born into a missionary family is you see the world and you're born into a lot of different countries. So unless you're careful, you lose touch with one another. And we're so thankful for our family, we'll call it a clan gathering, who have come from, let me get this right, Dubai, France, England, Ireland, the United States, Switzerland, who could forget Switzerland? Wales, Wales. all right, enough. And we have other people from all over the world. I know of uh, missionaries who work in Greece. I have a friend who's come from Germany. Um, appreciate all of that. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask some of our clan to stand. Well, maybe all of them, but not together. I'm going to ask my family to stand first so you can see who they are and where the noise is coming from. My family? Thank you. Thank you. David's family? Ruth's family? Thank you for that little bit of Americana introduction. Maybe not a lot of people know it, but my father served in the American Army during the war. His father took his wee family to the United States, like a lot of Irish people did, to earn some money. And unfortunately, his mom's, uh, dad's mom died over there, and they didn't earn a lot of money. And they sent the wee tykes back over the North Atlantic. My father was four, my, sis uh, my father was four, his sister was six, and they came over by themselves under the auspices of the Orange Order. So dad was basically raised in Belfast until he got a knock on the door from Uncle Sam reminding him that he had born, been born in the United States. Therefore, he must serve in the US forces. That's why we had the national anthem and so forth um, uh, of the United States. Not a lot of people know that. So dad was proud to be a GI, but he was also proud to be an Ulsterman. We're here to commemorate Bob McAllister. Bob, let, let me tell you a story. Mom and dad met when they were about 15. And all their lives, they were in ministry together. People know them or knew them as Bob and Alma. Bob and Alma, Bob and Alma. Then mom died. Bob and Alma team was split. And we were wondering, how is dad going to manage? At, the fu at mom's funeral, I remember watching dad intently throughout the whole service. And at the graveside, when people were starting to leave, dad was standing there by himself on his walking stick. And I went over to him, put my arms around him, and I said, dad, how are you doing? And he looked at me, and I was really surprised there wasn't a tear in his eye. He looked at me, and he looked at the grave, and he said, Billy, son, she's not there. She's not there. That explained everything. 
about my father. He totally believed the gospel. He totally believed the promises of God in the Bible that those of us who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ will go to God the Father in the end and we will live in paradise. And God made that promise and that accepted and Alma was in a much better place. So tonight, in spite of my tears, I don't want this to be a funeral. I don't even want it to be a memorial. I want it to be a praise service to God's wondrous salvation in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I was just about to say, if dad were here, he would shout, hallelujah. And if dad were here, he would say, well, is that the best you can do? So we'll try again, hallelujah. It's, it's genetic, it's genetic. So what we're gonna do tonight is we have a rolling program, which is here, and I'm not going to introduce any of it, neither is anybody else, but we have musical presentations by two of the best musicians in Northern Ireland, Jonathan and Sam, and I am, one, for one, I'm really gonna look forward to this, so it better be good, hey? Um, and then we have, uh, a sermon by uh, the Reverend Norman Smith. Dave is going to introduce all about the video. Ruth is going to introduce the music team because she's the musician in the family. So what I'm going to do is ask the Reverend Smith to come and open in prayer, and that's the last you're going to see of me. I will enjoy the rest of the service. Thanks, Bill, and to the whole family for inviting me to be part of this very special service tonight. Just cannot wait to worship God with you as we honor the memory of a servant who we stood in awe of, uh, Bob. And um, before we pray, may I read a few verses from the scriptures um, from Psalm 86, where we read, All the nations you have made will come and worship before you. O Lord, they will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. So let's come and seek this God's strength and help uh, tonight. Let's pray. So our great God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. It is our honor and joy to worship you tonight. We pray that you would be worshipped, that you would be enthroned in our praises uh, this evening. And we ask that as we listen, as we sing, as we pray, as we read together, and even as we perhaps shed an odd tear together too, we ask that you would be, we would be blessed by you and that you would be honored by the response of our hearts to the witness and testimony of your servant, the late Bob, and also his late wife, Alma. From the north, south, east, and west, Father, you are gathering people from every tribe, language, people, and nation to worship your holy name. And we're so thrilled by how many people from the Congo will be amongst that number as a result of their ministry through those decades. You are yourself a missionary God, Father. And by your planning and action, we ourselves have been found and rescued from lives of emptiness and sin and ruin. And we praise you for the champion of heaven whom you sent to achieve this victory, Jesus Christ, the promised king, who has established his everlasting reign. We rejoice under his reign. We rejoice in the victory he has achieved over sin and the devil. We rejoice in his love. We rejoice in his strength. He who is our shield and our defender. We sing of his might and of his grace tonight to save and we rejoice in his resurrection from the dead and in the power of the Holy Spirit he baptizes us in. Lord, though we confess our sins to you, reorder the affections of our heart tonight, help us cast down the idols wherever, whatever they be, call us back to the cross. All those who have grown cold or who are backslidden, Lord, call us back to the cross to renew our love and commitment to the Savior. And help us know afresh the great joy of sins forgiven by your grace. How glad are those with peace of mind their past wrongdoings left behind. And Father, we meet this evening to honor Christ, but also to celebrate the work of grace you performed in the lives of Bob, but also Bob and Alma, as they both were such a team together. 
You have surrounded us with such a great cloud of witnesses to spur us on by their testimony and words and deed. And Bob and Alma are certainly part of that assembly. As we recall their service to their Savior tonight, will you challenge each of us to similar lives of full surrender? Bless all who are taking part with liberty and the Spirit to minister, and will you take each of our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Father, receive our prayers as we offer them through the only saving name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Folks, let's stand together as we sing, How Great Thou Art.
I'm not going to say it. I am. Hallelujah. Come on. Hey. Those of you who remember dad, you remember he loved music. He loved praise and worship. And there's nothing quite as good as excellent musicians and a good Northern Irish congregation to sing. Dad would have been so happy. But I remember one time we were practicing singing as a family. And Dad, with his big old preacher voice, was in there with us, singing his heart out. And then Mom, who was quite lethal, she said, Ach, Bobby, you stick to the preaching. Let us do the singing. <laughs> I want to thank somebody. I will not mention their name because they would be embarrassed, and I'm not here to embarrass them. But thank you so much for arranging and, and allowing us to, enabling us to have Jonathan and the orchestra here tonight. That just is brilliant. Thank you. Now, there are some people that I have experienced who can actually sing better than all the Yeezons. And Billy forgot to mention them, the Congolese. And through this wizardry that Ruth was talking about, they are listening right now in Congo through this link because they said to me, we cannot miss this. This is our mze, our old man, but that's a term of respect in Swahili. So they are listening right now. And I would like to say, mes frères et sœurs en Jésus-Christ au Congo, soyez le bienvenu parmi nous. Mitonge kidogo na kingwana luga ya baba yetu. Aliko missioner pale Congo. Ali shinda maishi yake yote. Ndani ya mapenzo na mapendo ya baba Mungu. Na tunasema sasa pamoja haleluya. And I heard the hallelujahs from Congo. Isn't God good? I'm supposed to introduce the video. Here's what happened about this video thing. Dad was a bit of a scallywag. He really was. I never heard Dad criticize anybody, ever. And that was so annoying. So, you folks think it's easy to be known as Bob McAllister's son? <laughs> Come on, Dad. What that man did was wrong. And the closest dad would ever get, he would just say, ah, there you are now. And if somebody was referred to in that term from Bob McAllister, you knew you had come very close to the line. You better back up. You better back up. Ah, there you are now. The other thing was, he had these nostrils that when you're sitting in company and somebody says something that was hilarious, dad wouldn't burst out laughing, but if you look at him, the nostrils are going in and out. It was a giveaway. And you say, come on, dad, you're chuckling. And, he, right. and this happened. A journalist, I was sitting in his wee apartment in, 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 in Armand, and this journalist phoned up to do a, a, an interview with dad. And the journalist said to dad on the phone, said, um, I'd like to talk to you about the story. And dad said, oh, yes. I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior when I was 14, and I've had the, the wonderful privilege of serving him from, for, for, since then in, in, in Congo, and I, I, could, I could almost sense the wee journalist didn't know where to go. That's not the story he wanted. And there was silence, and the journalist said, no, but uh, can you tell me about the story? And Dad said, yes, the wonderful story of my Lord Jesus. And I said, Dad, catch yourself on. He wants the, rebel, the rebellion story. Oh, David's son. No, no. I said, yes. He wants the about the rebellion. Dad didn't like that. He didn't like that. So he was invited by the governor of Ituri province to go to Congo for the 50th anniversary of the rebellion. We survived. Many did not. It was a great honor and privilege for Dad to be invited. He was 89 years of age. What a pantomime that Billy and Norma went through getting them ready to go out. You'll see a bit of it here. And Sabine and I were already in Congo. We had a whole logistics team ready to receive the old man. Because I tell you, you'll see it tonight. A frail old man traveling in Congo is no easy thing. 
So he went out there to the Congo to relive the story of the rebellion. And guess what? He was always looking to the future. You'll see that in the video tonight. He did not wallow in the history. He was always looking forward to the next step he could take for the Lord Jesus Christ. But we didn't know, there was a friend here who said, I can arrange to send a cameraman for the BBC. And at first we thought, yeah, okay, that'd be great. And then we got to talk and thinking, well, sorry, if there's any journalists here, I'm not including you in this statement, but you gotta be careful with journalists, especially a, a, a man who's spent his life as a missionary, that can get twisted up by just innuendos. And, and we thought, well, that could, that could really hurt dad at the end of his life, if, if whatever these, whoever they are, if they, if they do something and has a negative context, that could really hurt the old man. So I told a friend, no, we don't want to do that. And a few weeks later, we were challenged. We said, we're leaving it in the hands of the Lord. That's what dad would do. So we did go ahead with it. And you will see the Lord was glorified through this BBC documentary. And the first time we saw it, it was with the journalist. There were tears in my eyes. And I said, it's such a blessing. I didn't expect that from the BBC. And you know what she said? Oh, there are saints in Caesar's household, you know. Amen. Thank you. In 1964, the African state of Congo was making headlines around the world. As a bloody rebellion swept across the country and the first international hostage crisis of its kind reached a dramatic conclusion. We have a note of their the names and the places that they're in and we shall make it our business to rescue them. You think there is some hope? I hope so. Caught up in the eye of the storm were the McAllisters, a missionary family from Belfast. We had the experience of seeing our wives and children put into a room and fired on by rebel forces and two of us men missionaries were taken outside to be shot. This is the story of how they came to be in Congo, their captivity and sensational rescue. what we called a corner boy in Belfast. Every few streets had a little gang and we're up to us all sorts of mischief and uh, people trying to help us and so forth. The boys' brigade and the life boys were a big influence on in my life <clears throat> to keep me straight. My granny made sure we got into the youth organizations of the church. I said to the boys that I knocked about with at the corner of the street, boys, there's a mission starting at the church tomorrow night, and I'm going. And I'm going to make the best of it. Sure enough, the mission started, and the preacher said, I wonder how many of you tonight want to flee from your destruction. Where will you flee to? And he put out his big arms, and he says, flee into the arms of Jesus. That was the turning point for me. I went home and told my dad that I'd become a Christian and I wanted to serve the Lord. And he, my dad said to me, well, you've done a good thing. I'll never stand in your way. And neither he did. Bob had been brought up on a strict Presbyterian diet of Scots porridge and the Shorter Catechism. But it was the mission hall preachers 
Men like the firebrand Ulster Scots evangelist W.P. Nicholson, who really influenced the route his Christianity would take him. It was at his local hall that Bob learned what it was to be an evangelist, where he made the decision to become a missionary, and where he met his future wife, Alma. There's a lot of after church meetings on a Sunday in different places, especially in the little mission halls. So I was up in the after meeting one Sunday night. I said to the fellow beside me, uh, Who's that girl there? He says, That's Alma Arthur. Do you not know her? I said, No. Look, he says, you're, you're blind, man. When you go to church, open your eyes, look around you. He says, She sings in every Sunday. He says, what are you asking for? I said, well, that's my wife. Now, that was love at first sight, and I meant it. Now, she was a little girl from the Crumlin Road. She was a little girl, I was a corner boy. I said to her, what do you want to be in later in life? She says, I feel God wants me in the mission field, and I just share it, hallelujah. And she says, quiet now. I said, oh, hallelujah, Peter, of course, I feel out that way too. So that was it. We both agreed we were to meet for the mission field. My daughter-in-law, she says, every trip Granda makes is a trip of a lifetime. She says, when's his lifetime going to end? I used to say, when I was younger now, and I was spent, at that time, we'd spent 30 years in the Congo. What I used to say was, 30 years living out of a suitcase. <laughs> we lost our earthly possessions three times over with rebellions. I mean everything. All our household equipment, bedding and all that, and kits and stuff, lost in rebellions and we had nothing. That was taken just two months before the rebels came in. So that's the last family picture out before the big rebellion of 1964. So that's our whole family there in that picture. Two sons, daughter, my wife, myself. I was in Congo earlier this year. And while there, the governor of province Oriental in the Congo invited us to his own home. And then he said, this year is the 50th anniversary since the missionaries were martyred by the Simbas in the rebellion of 1964. And I want as many of you people as possible to come back again and commemorate with us as we remember the missionaries who were killed by the Simbas. Yeah. We want to pray for Bob here, that you would hold him and keep him, keep him safe as he travels. We know that the journey is a difficult one, and as he comes, with, goes with Billy and, and, he, and Ruth and, and meets David and Sabine. We pray that as a family they might meet there safely. May he be a blessing to many. In Christ's name, amen. amen. At 89, this might well be Bob's last visit to Congo. When he first made this journey 60 years ago, he and Alma were newlyweds on their way to their first posting with the Unevangelized Fields Mission Society. The Belgian Congo, as it was then, was ruled by a colonial elite living in European-style luxury, a far cry from the remote primitive village where Bob and Alma were headed. landscape of the country. It was all new to us, and it was all very entertaining, and you see the wild animals living in their natural habitat. You're leaving your family, 
and your friends, and you don't know what you're heading for, and uh, everything was from then on in was new to to you. What I enjoyed about the Congolese, they could laugh at themselves, have a good joke, the same as the Irish people. The people there were expecting us. They gave us a great reception. As a stranger, you just see a, a sea of black faces. And they're all cheering and singing and rejoicing and waving palm branches and so on. But the reception was great. On their first morning in Baganga, Bob and Alma were having breakfast with the head of the mission station, the Reverend Kerrigan, when they got their first lesson in missionary life in Congo. An African came and said, quick, white man, there's a snake in the garden just outside the door. So Kerrigan, he says, come on, we'll teach, teach you how to kill a snake. So we had managed to get the snake killed, and then the Reverend Kerrigan said to me then, he said, now, get that into your prayer letter, because the people are anxious to know. And I put it in the prayer letter, in our first letter back home. And we were famous as Bob McAllister who killed a snake. That's why the people knew us, Bob McAllister who killed a snake. That made us famous, famous. So Kerrigan knew all that you say, about that's the way it would go. And it did go that way. Good to see you again. <laughs> I have mixed emotions about going back into Congo. Um, there's a lot of our family history there, but I haven't actually been on Congo soil for many, many years with my father and my two brothers. So I'm excited about that. I'm also sad that my mother's not there because she was always a great part of our family gatherings and our family history in Congo. To me, my mother is the bravest woman I have ever known in my life. My mum was a nurse and she worried an awful lot about illness, that we would get ill, that, you know, we would get sick. So it wasn't easy for my mother. And so I say that, you know, she was brave because she overcame a lot of her own fears and a lot of her own insecurities about being in a country like Congo. We were there totally integrated. Um, many's the day when my mother came back from the clinic she would have to ask the women of the village, where's Ruth? And they would point with their chin, down there, way down there. And she would have to go through all the houses to find me playing. Not, not every missionary allowed their ch children to do that. For me, growing up in, in the jungle was, was really fun. I mean, it's almost like a Hollywood set, you know? It's, and there was a lot of innocence. There was no thievery in the villages in those days. Um, we didn't have locked doors, we didn't worry about violence, we didn't worry about abuse or anything like that. We just played with the, the kids in the village. While life in Congo was an adventure for the McAllister children, every day threw up new challenges for their parents. Money was in short supply, so the missionaries had to be both practical and resourceful. Alma found her nursing skills tested to the limit. At Boyulu, which was doing the maternity work, she was 700 to 800 kilometers from the nearest mission doctor. So she had to do operations that would be done by a doctor if she, if she had been at home. When a missionary found how to do a job, he told the next missionary how to do it, or she, and uh, you learned that way. We had a rule amongst ourselves that no matter what professional job you're trying to do, teaching in school or, or building, if you felt an urge to get out to the forest, to some of the forest villages and preach, stop at what you're doing and get out there and preach, and you're here to preach. So we did a lot of going out to the villages, and my wife and I went down in amongst them and preached the gospel to them. Just memories are just flying back, taking us back 50 years, and it's just been, just been really, really wonderful. A little bit difficult reliving some of the scenarios and the violence that took place, but overall, it's been a very positive time for us, me and my family, and my kids. For Bob, 
this journey isn't just about remembering the past. It's also a chance to see how some of the churches he helped set up are doing today. I am another missionary. Built this church first of all, but then after about two years, we found out it was too small and they gave an extension in the building. Then after another few years, it was still too small, so they extended it again. The congregation has grown and it's great to see all these young people following on in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can only say, hallelujah. It's a joy to see it in the name of the Lord. The people at Bafosende may never have met Bob before, but they've almost certainly heard of him. His generation of pioneer missionaries are part of the folklore of the church in Congo. In the early days, they struggled to fill the churches. But in 1957, all that changed as the religious revival that had been sweeping across East Africa arrived in Congo. There was a great movement of the Spirit of God. All the villages became active and excitement. People would come into the mission station, travel 40 miles and more, just to get in for a 10-day conference. And they had no bedding with them. They stayed up all night to pray and read, and they'd just go and get a couple of hours sleep when they needed it, that's the way they went. You're praying for a revival at home here. We hear, we get the history of the 59 revival here, 1859, and we all would love it to come back. But I say, when I'm speaking about revival, be careful when you pray for a revival, because God might give it to you. And what would you do with it if you got it? The whole revival movement, it was a preparation for the persecution that was to follow. It's great to see a revival, but what about the aftermath when you're put to the test? In June 1960, Congo gained independence from Belgium. Its charismatic new prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, promised to make Congo a shining example for the whole of Africa. But within days, violence and rebellion broke out. The army mutinied against Belgian officers. The province of Katanga declared itself a separate state. Belgian moved troops in, so did the United Nations. With the country in chaos, the European population began to flee. The country came up absolutely unprepared. The Belgians had not taught people how to run the country at all. And it was said that there were 14 graduates only in the whole country, so what did you expect? So naturally, uh, no one was at all surprised when the whole thing began to collapse. The mutiny was really the problem, I think. That then, there was chaos after that. The Belgians began to panic because there were people being arrested and killed. Um, it's not surprising that uh, the Belgians started to leave the country en masse, and uh, thousands were flown out in the period of about two or three weeks. Among those airlifted out of Congo in 1960 were Alma and the three children. David was only six and Ruth a baby, but Bill has strong memories of the evacuation. It was like an old Hollywood film. There was, at the airport, rows and rows of cars and people running around trying to get their kids onto the last airplanes going out and chaos and suitcases being thrown around and people shouting and screaming and whatnot. But Dad was pushing and trying to get us onto an airplane and we take off from Stanleyville and we see Dad, a little dot way down there, and he's waving at us. And he got us out and then he and a lot of the other men missionaries stayed behind and we, then for six months we didn't hear anything. We thought he'd, he'd been killed, right? We went back to Ireland. Describe this, Dad. 
Well, it's just uh, down to Stanleyville Airport. There was a plane that you, the family were going home in, and I was standing behind. To, uh, the men weren't allowed to leave at that time. The women and children were allowed to leave, but not, not the men. We didn't hear from you for six months, and then we you uh, sneaked out, didn't you? Yeah, we drove across. We um, the two Land Rovers, John Arden and Land Rover, and I had one. That's John Arden. We drove across uh, northeast Congo, through Uganda, into Kenya. Aha. A lot of people there. That was our last missionary conference together. We had 64 missionaries at that, that stage. Undeterred by their experience in 1960, the missionaries came back to Congo as soon as it was deemed safe. Joining them on her first missionary posting was Alma's friend, Ruby Gray. Ruby Gray invited my wife to her Sunday shoot Christmas party for the children in Dromara. But coming home, Ruby Gray was leading my wife down to catch the bus for Belfast. We were living in Belfast at that time. And uh, Ruby started to cry. My wife said, what's wrong? So Ruby says, God has called me tonight to the Congo. That was the first we knew about Ruby Gray wanted to go to Congo. I'll never forget the day that my wife and I went into Stanleyville, and Ruby was arriving by airplane as a new missionary. And I can see the picture she had in my mind. She was the first passenger off the, to get off the plane. She held her Bible in one hand, and her songs of victory hammered in the other hand, raised them in the air, and she says, Hallelujah, I've come. And that was the beginning of things. Now, she only had three years of missionary work. But in the three years, she had learned the language, which was Bengala, and she had been useful and responsible for the building of a maternity hospital at Bunganza. So Ruby Gray was a great nurse. The Africans really loved her, of course, as they do with all their missions. The congregation at Bafosendi have organized a memorial to six unevangelized fields missionaries murdered here in 1964. It was very savage killing. It wasn't done by gun. This was machetes, what we call in Swahili, panga, and spears. And um, none of us can understand why. And the, the Congolese people today don't understand why. And yet Congo is still going through this kind of savagery. I do remember being told by some of the church elders that one of the young missionary ladies, Ruby Gray, and she was one of Mom's closest friends. And she was martyred. She was killed. And the local people said that when they threw her to the river after they'd speared her, she wasn't dead. But as she was sinking in the river, you can see the river, it's, she just raised her hands and her last words were, glory to God. And that's why people have come here to commemorate. Andy. We're going to stand together again and sing, please. Uh, we're going to sing a, a hymn by Martin Luther called A Mighty Fortress is Our God, um, responding to what we've just been seeing.
It is lovely to hear you in such good voice this evening singing with us uh, those great truths that the life that we have is worth living because Jesus lives. Uh, and those are the thoughts that drove um, Bob McAllister to do the things that he did and to inspire so many other people in their work for God's kingdom in doing so. Uh, but a huge part of the ministry of the McAllister family was built around music and certainly even around here locally. As a child, I remember having some of the recordings that they had made. And one of the songs that I know was very precious to the family was the song, The Stranger of Galilee, which was sung by Alma. And Sylvia has very kindly agreed to sing it for us this evening. So, The Stranger of Galilee. Thank you. 
go baba ye to ko ban go le to ne sini ga hapa ko komboga na mure kane wan do go ye to wa mishna and gini wa le ko va hapa to na le ma chuji ye to tango wa wa le ko va hata le ma chuji e ga pomona sie kazi ga na mure gini ko komboga wa to le ko va na ko fanya tansha Kazi a kanisa para kuisha. Hata dunia yote watasikia nela la mungu. Amen. The Simbas, who took their name from the Swahili for lion, had emerged out of the chaos that followed independence and the assassination of Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba. The movement's leaders aspired to a communist state but most of their supporters were illiterate tribesmen steeped in witchcraft who were set her life they had been promised at independence. And what began as a localized rebellion quickly spread across the country. News was getting through to us that there was rebels further south and it would maybe come in our direction, further north. There was an uneasiness some missionaries did get home there and felt there, was, there could be trouble. Anyway, but the rest of us decided to stay, swell it out. So uh, as time went on, things got worse and the rebels got stronger. By July, as the children were breaking up for the summer holidays, the Simbas had taken almost half the country. When Bob and Alma arrived at Stanleyville to pick up the boys from school, the rebels were closing in on the city, and US officials were urging their people to leave. The children arrived back one day, and the next day the rebels arrived. So we hadn't time to go out to our separate villages because the roads were blocked. And we were kind of unfortunate, fortunate to be caught in that situation. The American consul, who was abiding in uh, Stanleyville, Keith and Ghana, he rushed out to us and he said, quick, the rebels are advancing, they're coming, they're going to attack Stanleyville. There's a plane out and it's the last plane to safety and uh, I've, I've reserved it in seats for you, missionaries and children. We said, well, I we'll have to pray. He said, you're crazy. We told them it was God who brought us here. And it'll be God who'll take us out. All the roads were closed off. Some missionaries managed to get through the roadblocks and we never saw them again. Dad, I remember, tried several times. I remember him coming back saying, really disappointed yet again, he couldn't get a travel permit to, to get through the roadblocks to get back down to Ubuntu or Pontyville, which was our mission station at the time. We know now that if he had been given that permission, we would be dead, because all the white people were killed in, in Pontyville. So it was fortunate that he didn't get that, but at the time he was hugely frustrated, I remember that. Uh, so we were all sitting there in the mission compound and we, we couldn't go anywhere. When the rebels first took over, we were held as hostages for four months. We were confined to our own mission headquarters. We weren't allowed out. They tried to prove to the outside world that they were going to do the job right. And they had every intention of doing it right. So at that stage, the very early stage of our captivity, there is no harm at all. There's an interesting time when one rebel group came in and demanded food. And Dad says, food? You want food? And Dad looked, pointed to all the, the missionary group there and he said to the commander of the rebel group, he says, look at all these people that I have to feed. You think you got problems? I've got to feed these people. Ah, the guy said, all right, enough. So the guy disappears and the next day he comes back with food for us. <laughs> so anyways, that kind of old Earl Irish chitter that, that got us out of many a fix, you know. Fifty years on, this is what's left of the old missionary compound. 
Back in 1964, the rebels came in and out on a daily basis, their behavior becoming increasingly hostile and unpredictable. One night, the rebel officer came with a few of his soldiers to the door about two o'clock in the morning, and he says, where's the midwife? My wife's having a baby. She's in difficulty. So I, I said, Dalma, I'll go with you. She says, no, you stay with the children. Look after them, and I'll be all right. And on the way out, he said, Dalma, now, if this baby's dead, when it's born, you're dead also. So uh, that was a threat. And he meant it. So when we got to this wee shack that they put up just a bit of mud on poles and a leaf roof. So I went the door to deliver the baby. And my Alma said what all midwives would say, is this your first baby? That's the first thing a midwife says, is this your first baby? No one said no. I've had four babies before and they were all born dead. Alma delivered the baby and it was dead. As dead as could be. And I had just found out where this place was. And I had left our children and followed this trail. And I just came in at that moment when almost done with this dead baby in her hand. I says, Alma, hold the baby out. We'll pray. And I prayed. And while I was praying, the baby wriggled about. It was still alive. It wasn't dead at all. Or if it was dead, it was brought back to life. I don't know, I wouldn't argue what it was. Sometimes I think that, that child was definitely dead. And other times I think, well, it was just chewing her for, for a breath of air. And she gave it to the woman. And that uh, was the first live baby the woman ever had. Alma and Bob had had a narrow escape but the situation around them was getting worse. A group of British-led mercenary soldiers hired by Prime Minister Moise Chumbe had begun the fight back against the rebels in the south of the country. The Belgians and the Americans were planning military intervention in the north. As the rebels began to lose the fight, then they took it out on us. Threatened us from time to time that if we didn't obey them, they would be killed. And we got those threats very often. The rebels would come in every so often and fire guns around, and then they took a lot of the men uh, into prison in the, in the city. Um, and Dad and another missionary were, Hector McMillan, were allowed, allowed to stay with the group because they were not Americans. And that's how, when the whole thing erupted, that you had two men missionaries with our group and the others were in, in the city. In Stanleyville, there are a thousand whites, men, women, and children who are being held as hostages by the rebels. Among them are 25 British, 60 Americans, and more than 500 Belgians. And as the attack goes in, some of those people could be killed. And that is what is worrying everyone here. Early in the morning, about seven o'clock, we heard the drone of planes. That was a novelty for us, for there hadn't been airplanes in four months. Bells and power troops had arrived by plane to drop on Stanley for, for the rescue. We saw these airplanes flying overhead and, and the paratroopers was falling. It was like an old war movie, you know? Um, and the gunfire going off, and that was eight kilometers away, that was in the town. We realized that this was now the big push to take over the, the city, and we realized also that the, um, the rebel regime had threatened that if it did happen, that they would kill all the white people. That was it, end of story. So uh, it was only a matter of time before we were facing something. We knew 
see the rebels were kind of beaten at this stage. We heard the last broadcast from, from Stanleyville before the, before the power troops had taken over the radio station. And it was Khrushchev Gabenya, one of the rebel leaders in Stanleyville. And he made an announcement in Swahili. And he said, Simba's flee to the forest and every man take his bush knife and sharpen it and every white person you meet take the head off it. Flee, go boys, we're beaten. We heard that ourselves. So we realized the, the Simbas would be on the run, and they were. I remember that day when the Simbas came on. I was playing outside with uh, another missionary kid, and we were kind of coming around the corner of the building when we saw what we called funny men. We came running back in to tell our parents, quick, quick, there's funny men coming. What it was was they were dressed for war and fighting. They had their paraphernalia and different things on that I guess to us as kids just looked funny. The variables rushed into us and they lined us all out of the house in a straight line. And they stood in front of us in a straight line and every rebel held a gun up, fully loaded, pointed at us missionaries and at children. There was a gun pointed at every face. And it was only then that we realized we were facing a firing squad. I still remember very, very clearly, in a time of crisis, it is true, the world seems to slow down and you're very aware of absolutely everything that goes on. And I remember a little puff of white cloud going across the, 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 the blue sky and, and the leaves fluttering, you know, and, and, and it was just a surreal moment. I can remember facing the gun and uh, I said to my mom, is this when they're gonna kill us? And the reason I said that was because earlier that morning, our parents had told us Children, we don't know what's going to happen today. This might be the day when we're rescued, and it might be the day when we die. That final morning, of course, on the 24th, we came in for our breakfast, and that's where all the trouble started happening. We're pushed out here. And the rebels lined up here. And we were all lined up just here. It was this close. And that's where they started loading their guns to kill us. And when, they, for some reason, they said, they actually said, we can't shoot you people. The same group, after they'd been with us, went and killed some more white people. Us, they couldn't shoot. And that was my first example, if you like, of some sort of spiritual power that is bigger than us.
been asked to um, give thanks tonight, say a word of thanks to the musicians who are here. Isn't music a wonderful thing? How we can praise the Lord from the depths of our souls, our spirits. And you know, there's playing of instruments, which is fantastic. But then there's the whole feeling and the expression of the music. And these guys are doing a fantastic job. I think we just need to. And thank you, Jonathan. You guys have done a wonderful job just bringing everything together and helping us choose the songs that meant so much to my, my dad. And uh, that, la that last one. You know, the Lord's my shepherd. He was, he was a really good wee Presbyterian. My dad, you know, he loved that one, so he did. Um, and then there's Sammy Merland. Where, where are you, Sammy? Oh, there he is over there hiding. Uh, well, you all know about the, the McAllister family, don't you? The McAllister family quartet and the trio and all that there, and all the records and everything we did. Uh, well, we wouldn't, couldn't have done very much of it without Sammy. And Sammy was the musician who played on just about, I think, all of them, didn't you, Sammy, I think? The guitar, the piano, and I don't know what. You probably played, played some instruments you weren't supposed to, but played anyway. Um, and I just want to, this is really fitting because, <clears throat> Sammy, you don't know this, but my dad used to tell me off all the time that uh, <clears throat> I'd never make it, ha I wouldn't even be half the musician that that fella Sammy, as you know, because I don't practice enough. That fella Sammy's up from the crack of dawn, practicing, <laughs> and you're hopeless. You don't practice. You need to practice more. So he used to sit me down at the piano with his watch and all, and um, <clears throat> I caught on that if I started playing hymns, he would fall asleep. <laughs> so Daddy thought I was practicing, but you know, I caught on. But anyway, I thought this was a really good time, Sammy. Do you mind coming up? Come here, you. Sammy and I used to laugh about Nashville and how, you know, in Nashville they have all these musicians. And we used to say, I, they've never heard of us in Nashville. If they heard of us, we would knock the socks out, socks out of, of everybody because, you know, we're brilliant and all this. Do you remember all those wee conversations we had? I, well, we have a friend in Nashville who actually is a Christian musician, and he has a recording business there, and he has listened to your musicianship. And he has created this award for Sam Merland from Nashville Music City, USA in appreciation for all your ministry and music for the glory of God. Oh. And I know my dad's watching from heaven. <laughs> He's saying, I just thought this was a good time to do it, son. <laughs> Is this on? Sorry. This song I'm going to sing, uh, Sammy didn't play for me back in the day. Sammy, I don't know what age I was when I sang this, 17 or something. So I'm going to try and sing it tonight. But um, it is a song that I thought was really good to sing tonight because those of you who know my mom and dad knew them. The gifting the Lord gave them was for evangelism. I remember being in I'm not kidding. Being in an elevator with my dad, and from the first floor to floor 17, that's all it took for my dad to lead him on to the Lord. I'm not kidding. By floor 17, he was already praying the prayer, the sinner's prayer. And my dad got out at floor 17 with him, and that was the days of the yellow pages. And my dad asked him where he lived, and he looked up. And he found a church. Now be you there on Sunday and tell that pastor that you've given your heart to the Lord. So this 
song is one that I sang back in the day, and it's called, For Those Tears, I Died. And it's just a reminder that no matter what state our life is in, there is a Savior. And he sees the very tears that fall from our eyes, even when nobody else is looking. And the pain of sin can cause a lot of tears. But Jesus died for those tears.
took Macmillan and myself out for execution. They were going to kill the two men, leave the women and children. I was first, Macmillan was right behind me. And uh, suddenly they opened up fire on Macmillan. And he dropped dead. He was shot about four times in the back. And I turned to the rebels and I said, you've shot one of my best friends. And then they opened up, turned their guns on me. And the bullets went everywhere. One grazed me in the forehead, took a bit of skin off my head. And I remembered what I had learned in Belfast as a wee boy, playing cowboys and Indians. Bang, bang, you're dead. When you hear bang, bang, you're dead, you had to lie down. So I said to myself, there's no time to be on my feet now. So I threw myself down, face down, and lay as stiff and as dead looking as I could. And the rebels passed me by thinking I was dead. A rebel did go back in and shoot around the, the women and children. And I told my, my mama, I said, if there was any shooting, don't look to see where the bullets are coming from. Hit the ground, get as low as you can to get out of the road of the bullets. So my shirt is down. Moms threw the smaller children on the floor and then they put their bodies over us. I can remember almost feeling like I was suffocating. I was more worried about being suffocated, I think, by my mother than the bullets that were going around the room. Another group of rebels come up in one of their stone cars, we were making a, a getaway to the forest, and they stopped, looked on the house, and everything was silent. I heard them say, men were too late, the job's already done. How could those children be not yelling and screaming and shouting, but they weren't? They were silent. There was silence in the house, and the two bodies were on the path. They could see the bodies. They thought we were both dead, or weren't. I was still there. So they were all went on. The Macmillans and McAllisters have been close friends all their lives. But being back here today, at the place where Hector Macmillan was killed, has brought back memories that they have never shared with one another before. I actually remember that. I know exactly in that room where I was sitting, exactly. And I remember Mom saying, fall. Because the guy had already started shooting. So to me, it's action stations. So I fell down beside Stephen. So we were yeah. down on the ground, and then we heard the gunfire outside. I'll never forget, Steve said to me, I hope my dad's OK, whispered. And I said, yeah, I hope my dad's OK. The missionaries at Kilometre 8 had no idea what was happening beyond the compound or whether the rebels might be back. In Stanleyville, the Belgian paratroopers were gaining control of the city. But they had arrived too late to save 25 hostages, men, women and children, gunned down by the rebels as they fled. Al Larson, the American head of the unevangelized Fields Mission, was trying to find anyone who would help him to rescue the missionaries at Kilometre 8. One group of soldiers were willing to brave the five-mile journey through rebel-held territory. They were Cuban exiles sent into Congo by the CIA. Al Larson had led them, this mercenary group out to get a hold of us and rescue us. And he was shouting, Bob McAllister, Bob McAllister, where's Bob McAllister? And I came out to meet him. And we hugged each other. His wife and child were with us, but he had been in prison in Stanleyville because he was American. And uh, he was glad to see his wife and child. The mercenaries gathered around. The order was come quickly, no baggage, no baggage at all, and no dead people to be carried in. You're not allowed to, so we couldn't touch her, couldn't tear her, hack her dead body in. They had it, just had to leave it there. We had to get in these jeeps, and then they made us all lie down because the rebels were still shooting from the forest. But the, the mercenaries had machine guns, and they were sh sh machine gunning anything that moved. They fired continuously the whole way in on both sides. And I still remember watching the, the, um, the line of bullets 
going through the jungle and, and chopping trees and banana trees being sliced in half. I do remember being in the jeep with the machine gunner. He had me perched on one knee and he had the gun, um, like he was shooting the gun on both sides of the road. What I remember is the noise. I had never heard anything as loud in all my life. And I also remember the hot shells falling on my body. And I remember something going over me. That apparently was his neck scarf or something that he put over me to try and keep me safe from the uh, shells. And then they sped us away as fast as I could, the five miles into Stanleyville, and then out to the airport of Stanleyville. And there's a big C-130 plane waiting with his engine going. Hustled onto this plane. And the body of the plane was laden with stretchers, people had wounded, and uh, we, we had the side seats. The pilot, he was just taken off when a rebel on the ground I shot the plane and punctured one of the petrol tanks. He wondered if he'd reach Leopoldville, but he did. And he told us himself, he says, when I got to Leopoldville, I had enough fuel left that would have started a barbecue. But I was glad to get your chief. The McAllisters have finally made it to Kisangani. What was once the affluent colonial city of Stanleyville is still the commercial capital of Northern Congo. It seems fitting that 50 years after being airlifted out of the city, the family have returned to remember those who didn't survive the rebellion. church in Congo was flourishing, but in 1964, many Christians were persecuted and their churches destroyed. Back home in Northern Ireland, Bob felt a duty to the people he'd left behind, and within a year of being rescued out of Congo, was planning his return. There was one day, we were living in Mora at the time, I said to Alma, my wife, I said, Alma, I think I wish you'd go back to Congo. She said I was thinking the same thing. Let's go. And the children heard us the next, they were in the next room. And they said, we're going to. So we all went back as a family. Good people in Northern Ireland were not very happy about that. I heard, I heard them say to dad in 1965, Bob, how can you go back to those savages? God has rescued you up once. Don't tempt God again. Don't, don't do something stupid where you're going to have to be rescued out again. Well, we did come back. We went around the villages in the forest, and of course the people heard that McAllister family was back, and they would say to Mom and Dad, you came back, but not just you, you brought your children back. That shows you really love us. And I, I saw lots of Congolese leave, coming in from the forest. They'd been living in the forest for a year and a half, and they were like skeletons. It's, it's difficult to live in the forest. They were like skeletons. And we were talking around the campfires and asking, where's your children? And some of the kids that I knew had died in the forest of starvation. That really hit me hard. That, yes, we were rescued up, but they continued to suffer. The church went through big persecution when the rebels took over. And uh, it's amazing. I can't explain how those African converts from the revival stood against the rebels and their faith. We'd 
very very experienced to into these forest areas where all the churches and the, the villages were burnt down. Everything was just black cinder. And the Africans, they built churches before they built houses for themselves, mud churches. And I said to the Africans, why do you build a church before you b build a house for yourself? They said, they looked at me as though I had no sense. They said, it's only God who matters now. God first. The Lord looked after us in the rebellion. And we want a place of worship before we want a place of sleep. Walikufa, Fasi Pengine, Gulbi Moya Hapa, Savatura Kumuga Leo, Alakini, Pamoya Sisi and Akuya, Sadi Fano Macmillan, Baba Yaki, Alikufa, the same, Alikufa, Pamoya, the Miri. Was some of Alikumata Sisi Wile, Gua Sisi Goshamba, Bola Macmillan, Alik. Amen. <laughs> One rebel told away me when the rebels had control. They said, uh, there's no God. No Sundays anymore. But we're going to wipe out the church of Jesus Christ. The rebel told us that. You couldn't argue with him. You just had to swallow what he said. But there are more churches today in that area than there ever were before. As far as I see it, it's been worth everything we've gone through to see the growth of the church. That's what I died for, to spread the good news of the gospel.
So how long do they do they preach in the Congo? Three hours. Three hours. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Before I uh, share with you this evening, I want to turn to the scriptures and to read from a passage that came into my heart almost instantaneously we've been asked uh, to speak tonight. And that's found in Romans chapter 1. Chapter 1, from verse 8, where we read, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you, always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And here's the verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, man, to reading God's precious word. Whenever we remember or read off the lives of Bob and his late wife, Alma, it's hard not to be impacted and impressed by their spiritual fervor, their eagerness to share Jesus with people wherever they should be, wherever they were located for however long even, here tonight, even the duration of a, of a left journey in a building, they were, they were eager to share Jesus, made that their mission field for the moment, wherever they were. Too many of us are shy when it comes to personal evangelism, missing those everyday opportunities to share Jesus with the people that we happen in God's providence to be sharing a moment or two with. Count Zinzendorf, the famous Moravian leader of the 18th century, said, though every heart with Christ is a missionary and every heart without Christ is a mission field. Bob recognized that and lived on that basis. He endeavored to the very end of his life to share Jesus wherever he could. With the Apostle Paul, he could well agree I am not ashamed of the gospel. The Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel. We shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. And Paul gives us two broad reasons why we shouldn't be ashamed, and in fact, why we should be eager to share it wherever we can. And we might wonder, how could one be so eager to share a gospel that is um, so offensive? Because it's an offensive message in so many ways to natural ears. It's offensive because it claims that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. It's offensive because it exposes the problem of man's sin and his lostness. And that's an offensive thing to point out to modern man and man of any time. That they're lost and they, they can't with all their best endeavors ever endear themselves to their creator one day and get into his heaven. How repulsive to receive an assessment like this from God. How could anybody be eager to get a message like that out given the blows one will receive in the sharing of it as Paul himself certainly did. As we glean even just a snippet from the videos Bob and his wife Alma also suffered. Well, Paul gives two broad reasons why we should be eager to share the gospel. First broad reason, verse 16, he says, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. 
It's the power of God. Preachers love to point out the Greek word behind that word power is the same word from which we get our English word dynamite. But in the gospel, there's far more than dynamite. There's all the power of God the Almighty to save people from their lostness and their sin, to pluck them as a brand from the burning, to rescue them and to give them a new nature and give them power to change, to be conformed to the likeness of His Son. How has this victory been achieved? Well, we're told in the scriptures and the gospel, it's achieved through the cross of Jesus Christ. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's where the power was released upon Jesus' death on the cross. Through the power of his sacrifice, where he changed places with all who will believe in him and satisfied the full demands of divine justice so that people can be forgiven for all that they have done. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Salvation. It's essentially a word that means a rescue, deliverance. Rescued from what? Rescued from the penalty for our sin. What is that penalty? It's death. It's to face judgment one day. It's to suffer after that separation from God forever. What's called the second death. Jesus alone has the power to rescue sinners from that penalty. Jesus also rescues people from the power of sin for today. As by his power he overcomes our sinful nature, gives us a new nature which grows within us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Only in the gospel of Jesus Christ can people be changed. We do so many things to try and change ourselves. And the changes, results are at best patchy, at best temporary. But the power that Christ has to change people brings a permanent change, one that will last for eternity. It should make us so eager to want to share this message because in it there is power, power to change lives. It's the power of God for salvation. And something else that should make us eager in there is that it's for to everyone who believes. There's such a powerful illustration of that, everyone in the, the book that Bill wrote in the line of fire. One of the rebel generals who had given the order for some of Bob and Alma's colleagues to be murdered, to be executed, it was found in the jungle and he was dragged out of the jungle from his hiding place. He was tied to a pole and carried helplessly through the angry crowd to kicks and punches, we read. And Alma happened to be there. Bob was absent at the moment. I think he was visiting a hospital or something and Alma pressed through the crowd to meet this man and she said to him, is it true? And he said, yes. He confessed all that they say is true. They're going to kill me, but I deserve to die. Can even God forgive me? Well, Alma recognized the divine appointment she had with that man in those moments and shared the gospel with him, and the result was he was saved. And this moment, Paul would say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we say, Hallelujah. 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 No one is beyond Christ's power and grace to save, to rescue, to deliver, to make whole. Note, though, that you do not receive this automatically, this blessing. We need to exercise something if we are to receive this blessing of, of the gospel and its power to be changed. We need to believe it and believe in the one who has achieved it for us, Jesus, Jesus Christ. We have a golden retriever at home and for reasons unknown to us, she has been born with the instinct that she has an aversion to bridges. And whenever we're out walking and we come anywhere near a bridge where there may be water passing underneath, she falls down on covering her legs like a, like a stubborn goat and refuses to move any further forward. We don't know where she got this instinct. We had her from a pup. She was born with it. And yet, what a powerful illustration of the powerful aversion we are born with to refuse to cross that bridge who is Christ into a relationship with our Creator, the living God. And nothing will change our mind until God, by His power, ambushes us. 
whether by his love or whether by fear, he gets us and calls us irresistibly by his grace to believe in his Son, the only escape from this earth and to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let us be eager to share this gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And second, and much more quickly, the second broad reason Paul gives in the text for why we should be eager to share this gospel, he says it's because in it the righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed in at least two ways. One, the rightness of his moral nature to punish sin consistently as seen in the gospel because he punishes our sins. Difference is, though, for those who believe in Christ, he punishes that sin in the person and the soul and the body of Christ Jesus instead of you. But also this passage, this phrase is technically referred to, the righteousness that is from God is also revealed, and that is the righteousness of Christ himself. For a two-way transaction took place on the cross. Yes, he died there to take the punishment for our sins, but he also gave us something. His righteousness, the record of his perfect law-keeping, transferred to those who believe. So they become spiritually rich in God's sight. From what we read in the book, it seems that in the early days, Bob and of Alma being together, they were as poor as two church mice. Sometimes that was providence. Sometimes it was because they'd given away what they had. But what they always had was the most expensive gift in all the universe, and that is Christ Jesus. And they couldn't wait to give him away either. And they gave him away wherever they could. The scandal of this gospel is that it's free. Shouldn't make us so keen to give it away. Jesus Christ is God's gift for your salvation. But he's not just for you. He's for your neighbor too. So don't keep him to yourself. Just give him away. All who have Jesus should be eager to give him away. Now lift up your eyes, Jesus said, and see that the fields are white for harvest. The Apostle Paul charges, charges every believer in this same letter Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, just as Bob did. I hadn't the pleasure of meeting Alma, but I had the joy of seeing him just for a few months uh, towards the end of his life. And to see his spiritual fervor still sharing Jesus, even if it was with the patient in the bed beside him in the hospital, still sharing Jesus. And remembering, there will be opposition, but not to be afraid of it. We read in the book Alma's lesson that she carried through her life. The Lord never makes it too difficult. His grace is always sufficient for whatever challenges you will meet when you share him. May I finish with words that we heard on two different excerpts in the videos from Bob's lips. I will not attempt to say them in Swahili. But he said, as he remembered colleagues and friends fall, and he said, the work of the church is not finished until the whole world hears the word of God. We're not finished. And then he said in another expert, excerpt, which you heard on there too, young people, listen to the word of God. Go and preach and God's blessing. Here's a promise. God's blessing will be with you. Let's pray. Our heavenly father, we thank you for this gospel. We thank you for the completion of Christ's work on the cross for our good. We thank you that now sinners may be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we receive the gospel as what it is, the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And while you thrill our souls with the possibilities of such a gospel, the possibilities it opens for men and women and children to be forgiven, to be set free, to be changed forever and conformed, to Christ's likeness. While Christ's work on the cross is finished, we are reminded though tonight that ours is not. We are facing a task unfinished that drives us to our knees and need the undiminished rebukes our slothful ease. Almighty God, lead we who rejoice to know thee to renew before thy throne the solemn pledge we owe thee to go and make thee known. Grant us the power of the Holy Spirit to flood our weaknesses with your strength. We thank you tonight.
for the witness and challenge of the lives of both Bob and Alma. We remember them so together. We thank you for their example of living by faith. We thank you for the example of enduring great hardships and proving your grace always to be sufficient. Thank you for the example of their spiritual fervor, which they kept to the end. Thank you for the countless people who came to faith through them. We pray for the strengthening and encouraging of the churches they have served in the Congo and, and also around the world. And as one generation of saints has departed and entered their inheritance on high, we pray that you would irresistibly call to yourself young people from the rising generation to faith in Christ and to similar exploits of faith for the sharing of the gospel. Will you richly bless and spiritually equip those currently in training colleges, currently those who are in language studies, it's really difficult. Will you encourage them where they're disheartened? Will you bless and protect all those who serve you in the mission field tonight? Will you, will you support them and encourage them with your love? Satisfy their hearts with Christ. We pray for the whole McAllister family who tonight have invited us to be here. Continued, who continue to miss their dad father figure and grandfather and an uncle, someone who they had to share with so many people the whole time they had him, but Lord, didn't begrudge them, didn't begrudge us. And the Lord who has made such an indelible mark on their lives, comfort them and encourage them through the Christian hope of the reunion to come for all who are in Christ. And Father, finally, we pray for those who are still not in possession of Jesus as their Savior. As the end draws near, as the day of salvation hastens past, Lord, open their ears and hearts to hear your welcome voice that calls them, Lord, to thee. Overcome their resistance, even now, by your grace, and put it into their hearts to cry, I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed at Calvary. For the glory of his saving name. Amen. As we come towards the very end of this evening, we're going to sing together again. Um, we have been really enjoying hearing you behind us as we've been playing this evening. Thank you for singing with such enthusiasm and zeal as you've uh, sung these wonderful old hymns. Aussi pour nos fleurs et nos sœurs à Congo, qui regardent et chantent avec nous. Uh, it's been wonderful to share this evening with you. Thank you very much. Um, so let's start one last time. Um, Sylvie's going to lead us in the verses of this one. You will get the chorus and you will know what to do. Uh, let's sing together. <laughs>
you, Lord. May I send us from this place with these words from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. This love I cannot understand. Unworthy, unworthy, a beggar in bondage and alone, but he His mercy 